So as we look at the three circles presentation, I hope this message will give you a reminder of what the gospel is all about. What is the message of the Bible? Who is this Jesus and why did Jesus come to the world? And I really hope you enjoy this explanation. You see, my friends, we live in a world that's characterized by brokenness. We don't have to look very far um, and we don't have to look very hard to see that there are things in the world like disease and disaster and destruction. There's a lot of pain in the world. Um, but our brokenness was not God's original design. God has a perfect design for all of us. And we can see evidence of God's perfect design. For example, when we see the beauty of a newborn baby, what a beautiful miracle, what perfection. You can see God's perfect design in a baby. You can see God's perfect design in an incredible sunrise or an incredible sunset. But the reason why we've ended up in brokenness is because of what the Bible calls sin. Each of us, we've walked away from God's perfect design. We've walked away from it. And we've now started to pursue our own way in life. And that leads to brokenness. We're leaving God's perfect plan and we're now going towards brokenness. And brokenness eventually leads to death. And death will be a separation, an eternal separation from us, from God. Now God, he loves us very, very much. He created you and me. He loves you so much and he does not want us to stay in brokenness. And so he provided a way out through his son, Jesus. You see, because God is so amazing, God was able to um, create uh, himself in the form of a human being through a virgin. You see, what do we know about Jesus? Jesus is fully God. And yet he became fully man in order to enter into our brokenness. So he came down to earth. He came into our brokenness. He became fully man. But in God's nature, he was able to live a perfect life. And that's because he is God. And it's here that God took our place on the cross. He died a cruel, painful death on a cross. He died a death of shame because all of our sin, it's shameful. And so it had to be paid with a perfect life. So Jesus was the sacrificial lamb that came to die on the cross. He didn't only die, he was abandoned as well. He had to be fully abandoned by God the Father in heaven so that he could take all of the punishment for all of the sin of all of the world on his body. And after three days, because Jesus was not only a man, because Jesus was also God, he was raised up to life after three days. He rose from the dead and today Jesus is alive. Now, in doing this, God has made a way for us out of brokenness because we can go to Jesus now and our life can be restored now, in the world today, in different countries, in all the countries where we come from as a group, people try many things to get out of brokenness. You know, people try things like religion. They try things like different religions and philosophies and practices. Maybe they're born in a religion and that's why they believe what they believe. So they continue to do those things. But with these religions, they cannot escape brokenness. People try success. People try doing well with their education, with relationships. People try careers, good jobs. But none of these, these things get us out of brokenness. Many people, they try bad things like drugs and smoke and alcohol. But none of these things can get us out of brokenness. But Jesus told us that if we do three things... We can get out of brokenness. Number one, we need to believe that Jesus is God, but he became fully man. 
and that he died and rose again for you and for me. It was the biggest gift God could give us. The second thing we need to do is to turn away from the bad things we do and say sorry to Jesus. There are things that we do like we lie, we steal, we hate. The Bible says if you've hated somebody in your heart, it's the same thing as murdering them in your heart. So all of us, we need to say sorry to Jesus because it's Jesus who died on the cross to pay for the sin. And also we need to surrender to Jesus. We need to not only believe, not only say sorry, but we need to live for him now. And we need to allow him to change us. You know what? The Bible tells us we can all be forgiven. Now, when we do this, we can leave brokenness. And and now we can be sent because of Jesus into God's perfect plan. And that's what's so special. And that is what Jesus Christ does when he comes into the life of a true believer. Many people, they call themselves Christians. Don't believe it. It is not enough to call yourself a Christian. We need to believe. We need to turn away from the sins. And we need to surrender to Jesus. Only the true believer through Jesus can enter God's perfect plan. And now in God's perfect plan, we can now go back into a broken world. We can go back To meet all the people, our friends, our family, our acquaintances, our work colleagues, our fellow uh, people. And we can go back into their broken world and we can help them understand who is Jesus. And how through Jesus we can make our way to God's perfect design. Now friends, there are two types of people in the world. Two types of people. You got the first one. They are in God's perfect plan. They have received forgiveness from Jesus Christ. They put their faith in him. They turned away from their sins and they are living for him every day. That's the first type of person. And the second type of person is the person who's still living in brokenness. Now I want to ask yourselves, all of you, but where do you see yourself in this picture? Have you understood today that through God's perfect plan, um, perfect plan, it is because of sin that the sin has now damaged our relationship with God. We live in a world full of brokenness and pain. Have you understood that? Have you understood that in your life there are things that are not good? There are things in your life that are not acceptable by God. Have you understood that? Because if you have, then I hope you, if you have understood today that It is Jesus. He's the only one who could pay for the bad things we've done. It is only him who could provide the way for us to be forgiven. So today we're going to be looking at prioritizing the gospel proclamation. We've actually looked today at a a one type of gospel presentation that explains the message. Um, But now we're going to be looking at what do we do with that message now that we know it now that we have this message the message of the gospel is the good news that we can be forgiven the good news of salvation it's the message that's that saves the world It's the message why jesus came to the world but now as we get involved in christian ministry as we now try to serve god every day you know what do we do with that how can we actually um, move forward how can we prioritize what we've done When we started our teaching together, we looked at the first session, the priority of the church. Now we're going to be looking at the priority of the gospel. And I'd like to speak about one of my great heroes in ministry, a man called D.L. Moody. Now, D.L. Moody, his name D stands for Dwight, Dwight L. Moody. He was a revivalist preacher and he um, lived from 1837 to 1899. 1837 to 1899 and when he started his ministry as a as a christian believer his emphasis in all of his activity and all all of his work was good works he was trying to feed the hungry he was trying to give housing to the orphans he did an amazing work lots of good works 
but it wasn't until later years when his emphasis and direction in ministry changed. It changed from good works to proclaiming the gospel. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to examine why would one of the most famous preachers that has ever lived, uh, you know, why would he change his ministry? And also when he was older and maturer, um, you know, obviously he must have had good reasons. Now, D.L. Moody, I think he's one of the most amazing examples of someone who really had his eyes opened to the power of the gospel. And again, when I talk about gospel, that message I shared in the beginning, well, that's the gospel. It's the, it's the explanation of what Jesus did for us and how he has um, enabled us to be forgiven. So we don't have to go to hell. We can now go to heaven when we die through faith and repentance. Um, you know, I think if you spoke to um, D.L. Moody right now and if you gave him the chance to live his life all over again, then I'm pretty sure he would most certainly have made the change earlier. So I think we'll do really well to learn from D.L. Moody. But be before we start to unpack, you know, why he did this change, I think it's helpful that we start defining what are good works. In every religion in the world, there are people doing good works. You know, Muslims, Christians, atheists, in fact, everybody, they seem to be doing good works. So what are they? Uh, and so we can understand how do good works, how do they differ from the gospel message? So as we look at good works, let's try to understand what it means. If you go to the Old Testament, you know, if you go to the Old Testament of the Bible, typically good works would largely focus on the issues of the day. <clears throat> so those issues would include fighting injustice, defending widows and, and the aliens in the land. Um, also defending people that were oppressed. You know, good works in the Old Testament would be acts of mercy and setting captives free. Really important things. So in that culture, in that generation, these were the typical battles that people were fighting. And this would, if you were involved in these, you were doing good works. Now, if we move to the New Testament, again, we see a, maybe a slight change, maybe a, a modernization of these good works. In the New Testament, you know, typically we see people feeding the hungry. If you remember, Jesus himself, he was feeding the 5,000 people with the loaves and the fishes. But, you know, that example of seeing Jesus feeding the hungry Many of God's followers, followers are doing that, clothing the naked, loving our neighbours in practical ways, visiting people in prison and so on. And these were typically in the New Testament, the types of good works people would be involved with. And the list is not exhaustive. There's more, of course. Now, in today's world, in our postmodern world that we live in, Good works, they, they include all of those things I've mentioned already, <clears throat> but so much more. You know, making friends with the unchurched, building medical clinics, handing out food parcels, setting up food shelters, you know, um, counselling centres, you know, arranging group for groups that focus on reaching prostitutes or reaching drug addicts, um, you know, children's and parent groups, rehabilitation centres, helping the homeless, homeless shelters, and so on. You know, um, you name it, but in today's church, we have developed a heart for these works. And, you know, and, and so it should be. I think it's amazing that, you know, today, Christians should be doing all of these things. I mean, after all, in the, in the New Testament, it's James who said, faith without works, it's dead. Faith without works is dead. And so it's actually good that all the good works are happening. It's very good. And we mustn't stop. We must continue. Continue doing good works, of course. Um, and I want to encourage you. I mean, Christianity without good works would be a contradiction. It would be a complete contradiction. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, surely there should be evidence. And people can see the evidence through the good things that are being done. That's why we've got to do them. And anyway, the Apostle Paul, he went as far as to say, you know, 
<clears throat> if you're a Christian, then prove it. He said in Acts 26 verse 20, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. So right there, I think that's very, very important that we see that, you know, even the Apostle Paul is is saying this. Um, <clears throat> now, it's interesting, but in today's church in the world today, um, there's a very, very strong emphasis and a strong trend towards doing good works as a way of wooing the lost and also giving credibility to our message. We do good works and it backs up what we're saying. <clears throat> and it's also important that the church is emphasizing on, on expressing genuine love for people and for God. But my question to you today is, you know, are good works, you know, are good works the best way? Are they the best way to win the world? Are they? Um, and, you know, the great evangelist, the great uh, revival preacher, D.L. Moody, well, he obviously thought good works were the right way in the beginning, but then he changed his mind. Why is that? Why did D.L. Moody change his mind? And so, um, you know, I think it's amazing that, you know, you know, uh, he changed his mind and it changed his emphasis. It changed his direction to proclaiming the gospel. Now, please keep in mind, you know, God so mightily used D.L. Moody. Not only, you know, he, he, he could actually choose any city he wanted to to hold his campaigns to to reach people and i think it was over a 40 year span moody preaching uh, preached to over 50 million people isn't that amazing 50 million such a lot of people at the end of the 19th century there were religious leaders um of every american city they were so eager to have him come along to preach in their city and uh, some people, they even, they built big arenas for D.L. Moody to be able to come along to preach. Now, um, in his early years, he had combined proclaiming the gospel with acts to relieve poverty. All the good works I spoke about. But later, he, he, his emphasis changed. It concentrated on proclaiming the gospel. He would just be preaching the gospel. Yes, his ministry would be involved in acts of charity. But his new emphasis was proclaiming the gospel. He became convinced that the best way to help poor people was to lead them to Christ first. To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness first. And all these things will be added unto you. And when he changed his emphasis... Well, his success was dramatically increased. Now, I'd like to share with you what did D.L. Moody understand from Scripture. That's what we're going to look at today. Only four points. And I think if you can remember these four points, I think you're going to find it beneficial in your life as a believer and as you're trying to serve God and live for God. But from these scriptures, we can see how his priority changed and how our priority ought to change as well to assign proclamation of the gospel through four factors. What do we know about the gospel? The gospel is elevated in its power to save. Let me say that again. The gospel is elevated by its power to save. Now, it's important to remember this about the gospel. What do you know about the gospel? Remember, it's elevated by the power to save. We read in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And he goes on to say first the Jew and then to the Gentile, the Jews and the non-Jews, everybody. So there's power. So here you can see the gospel is given a special status. There are many, many messages, but the gospel, it has a now a special status. 
um, it, it, it has a particular power that's given by God to save a person, to change them from whatever religion, whatever situation, to move them from death to life. You know, Paul could have said prayer. Prayer is the power of God for salvation. But he didn't. Paul could have said worship. Worship is the power of God. He didn't. He could have said good works is the power of God. You know, he could have said teaching, discipling, running churches, doing all of these projects. But he didn't. Paul said the gospel is the power of God. It is the gospel alone that is given this unique status. A second point I'd like to bring to you that D.L. Moody would have come to realize in his later ministry is the gospel is elevated by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is elevated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's very interesting, but Jesus assigns priority to the proclamation of the gospel. When Jesus commanded the whole church to go into the world and proclaim the gospel, in Mark 16, 15, he said, go into the world and proclaim the gospel. Um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting, but this is the climactic um, command given a real focus. You know, the Lord Jesus gave many, many, many commands, but this one has a particular focus. He said it at a particular time before he ascended to heaven. Uh, and it's quite important to know this. You know, it's, it, it was the practical outworking of the first and second great commandments that God gave us. And you remember the first and second command. The first one is to love your God of all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And the second great commandment is to love your neighbor like you love yourself. You know what? And and this command is is really the outworking of these two great commandments. Sorry, I need to correct what I said to you. This great commission is the outworking of these these two great commands. So this is the great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel. And that's why it's called the great commission, not the commission. Not the small commission, not the medium commission, not uh, not the large commission. No, the great commission. So we see that the gospel is elevated by the power to save. The gospel is elevated by the Lord Jesus. And the third thing we learn is that the gospel is elevated by its connection to the second coming. Its connection to the second coming. Because you see, Christians, we live in the hope that our Saviour will come back in a day that is unknown to people. You know, in the Bible, the church is described as a bride. Now, those of us that would have got married, those of us that would have gone to a wedding, what a beautiful event to go to. I remember my wedding and, you know, I'll never forget it. I have the photographs and every year on my anniversary, I am very proud to post my picture of me, the groom, with my wife, the bride. Now, remember, the church is re represents the bride and Jesus represents the groom. And that is the illustration that Jesus gave to us. You know, usually how keen is the groom t for the bride? So keen, so keen to see his love of his life. They're going to get married and, and live together and, and have that special union before God. Um, Jesus wants to come back again. He wants to receive his bride. He wants to receive us. Um, but there's one thing that's stopping him coming back. And we read in Mark 13 verse 10. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. The gospel must be preached first to all nations. You see, Jesus is not going to come back yet. There's no way he's going to come back until all the nations. This means every person needs to hear the gospel. They may not believe. In fact, many people will reject. They will th think it's rubbish. But the gospel, according to scripture, must first be preached to all nations. You see, what does it tell you and me about about this wedding, this this spiritual wedding? The gospel is so important uh, to the Lord Jesus. 
He could have said, actually, you know, he would not return until everybody is praying. He's not going to return until everybody is singing worship songs. (laughs) He's not going to come back until everybody's doing good works. No, he didn't say that. He said the gospel is what's going to be preached first before he comes back. And so we can see that the gospel is elevated by the power to save. It is elevated by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You can see the gospel is elevated by the connection to the second coming. The gospel is very important. And the fourth final point I'd like to share with you is that the gospel is also elevated by testimonies. That is where Christians like you and me, we have an experience of Christ. We get saved and then our testimony continues to elevate the gospel. And one of the powerful testimonies is that of the Apostle Paul. Paul is emphatic that if all of his work and effort as a missionary did not result in the church proclaiming the gospel, he said that his his life's work would have been in vain. Look at the words. He says, so that you may live a life so you may be blameless, to be children of God, for, um, in no fault in, in, uh, in, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of, lo- of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. You see, Paul says it very clearly. All of the things, the teachings he was trying to give the church. And you know, the church has been very wayward, very sinful over the generations. I feel very ashamed at times. Even today, I'm thinking, can't the church do more? You know, I'm looking, but I'm not seeing the evidence. Well, Paul was back then, uh, you know, challenging them to try to shine like stars, make a difference. You know, um, and, uh, because he did not want his 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 uh, to labor in vain, and this should be the challenge for you all and me. You see, D. L. Moody is not not alone in, in coming to recognize the priority that should be given to proclaiming the gospel. If you know, if we want to truly change society, you know, Billy Graham has always believed that the best way to win the world and change society is to mobilize the church to proclaim the gospel. And Billy is one of my heroes who's gone home to be with the Lord now. But listen to what Billy Graham says. He says, I am convinced that if the church went back to its main task of preaching the gospel and getting people converted to Christ, it would have a far greater impact on the social, moral and psychological needs of men than any other thing we could possibly do. He says some of the greatest social movements of history have come about as the result of men being converted to Christ. For example, the conversion of William Wilberforce that led to freeing of the slaves. The conversion of George Williams that led to founding the YMCA that has helped thousands and thousands of of young people, homeless people as well. Scores of current and up-to-date illustrations could be used. We've made the mistake of putting the cart before the horse we're exhorting men to love each other before they have the capacity to love each other and this capacity can only come through a personal relationship with jesus christ and i think betty graham is so right you know please don't misunderstand me now today (laughs) you know prayer and intercession and worship and good works yes they're lovely don't stop doing them They play a vital aspect to the Christian life and service. And we need to do them vigorously. Amen. But come on, my friends. We must give each of them the same emphasis found in the New Testament. That is the emphasis that we need to give them. No more, no less. And so I wonder, you know, could it be that churches today and Christians today, maybe we've become imbalanced Maybe we're doing too much of the wrong thing and, you know, we're getting very confused. Remember, the balance needs to be words and works together. They got to go together, my friends. And so that's why really right now I just want to just, you know, challenge you to, to remember that. Do the good works, 
Um, but please do not neglect to do the words of the gospel as we've been commanded by Jesus. So many Christians don't share the gospel. Why? We need to share the message. Now, now the question maybe you're asking me is, okay, Tony, we understand that there needs to be lots of good works, but also we need to do the words. We need to preach the gospel. Words and works together. But on what authority do we get this? Is Tony now sharing his personal opinion? What authority do we have for this teaching? That there should be a balance with social action and good work and uh, of good works and and evangelism. Well, you'll remember in the teaching that we shared with you, we've shared um, where conventions with hundreds and hundreds of the world's leading Bible scholars, and I'm talking about the most reputable scholars of all, they came together, and one of them was in Switzerland and Lausanne in 1974. And they wrestled with this question in, in its inaugural meeting in 1974 about the balance between evangelistic work and social action. And please, I'd like you to listen to what they, they confirmed. They confirmed that all of us needs to break out of our ecclesiastical ghettos and permeate the non-Christian society. This is part and parcel of the church's mission of sacrificial service. As we've seen, it includes both evangelistic and social action so that normally the church will not have to choose between them. But if the choice has to be made, then evangelism is primary. And by the way, this is Dr. John Stott who's speaking here. He goes on to say two reasons are given. The first is the immensity of the task. World evangelization requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Unless the whole church is mobilized, the whole world is not likely to be reached. The second is the biblical truth that the church is not a man-made society, but on the contrary, is at the very center of God's cosmic purpose. The church is God's appointed means of spreading the gospel. Thus, God's purpose and the world's needs together bring to the church an insistent call to evangelize. And, you know, that is so important. This is our, our, our calling. Unfortunately, um, you know, in many churches, worship and good works and prayer and concerts and all these vanity projects that we still insist on being involved in and pouring out our energy and our time and our money you know these things seem to have taken a priority over preaching the gospel jesus said preach the gospel why can't we do it you know i ask you my dear friends you know ask yourselves the question how are you how are you faring with this challenge how is your church faring what about your wider denomination or your neighboring churches that you're aware of how are they doing you know is it only those with the gift of evangelism in your church who go out to proclaim the gospel regularly is only those few that do it but really most of us well i'm too busy ah i've got this problem ah i got this excuse are you with me my friends let's stop with the excuses. How are you going? How are you doing with proclaiming the gospel? You know, what is the hallmark of your church? You know, I wear this ring, it's my wedding ring, and it's a gold ring, and I'll wear this all of my life until I die. And in there, I've got a hallmark. It tells you um, what carat gold my ring is. It's what people that get married, they wear these things. Well, that's got a hallmark. What is the hallmark of my life? of your life what is the emphasis of your ministry these are the questions you, you need to ask yourself and it's not emphasizing proclaiming it because if your life is not emphasizing proclaiming or spreading the gospel then i'm sorry but your life is out of sync with the new testament dr john stott said evangelism is the major instrument of social change for the gospel changes people and change people change society We've seen that society needs salt and light, but only the gospel can create them. This is one way in which we may declare without embarrassment that evangelism takes primacy over social action. And listen to another 
famous preacher, General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, take a man out of the slums, heal his body, give him decent clothes, provide him a home in the country, and then let him die and go to hell. Really, it's not worth it. You see, my friends, both of these people, both of these amazing preachers, they clearly recognized the limitation of good works. Don't stop doing good works. It's, it's part of the evidence of your Christianity. But what these famous preachers and D.L. Moody came to understand is that the greatest priority is souls. It's souls. It's souls. It's souls. It's souls. It's souls. And you know, and that brings me back to that amazing Bible verse that we shared already today, where Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Oh, it really is the power of God. Amen. And really in finishing, I want to ask you, can you please imagine with me today? Can you imagine? Can you imagine a church or a Christian person building relationships? Can you imagine a church that's doing good works? Can you imagine a, a church that's showing God's love? That's prayer focused, worshipping, teaching, discipling and proclaiming the gospel can you imagine a church like that because that is a powerful church now let us pray dear lord jesus we love you very much indeed and we thank you so much for this day that you've made and i just want to thank you so much lord for the gospel i want to thank you lord that um it, it is a message that has transformed us got it it is an explanation of what you did on the cross where you died for our sins. You defeated death, you defeated sin, and you came back to life. Thank you so much that this is good news. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that we will believe it, that we'll accept it, that we'll, we, uh, and that now that we would change our emphasis and priority in li our lives in ministry, that we would elevate the gospel in its power to save. That, Lord, that we would elevate the gospel because of you, because of who you are and what you've done. Please help us, Lord, to elevate the gospel by knowing the connection with the second coming. And please help us, Lord, elevate the gospel with testimonies like the Apostle Paul and many people, but also with our testimonies. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we say this prayer in your wonderful name. I pray for a blessing over my brothers and sisters that have joined today and people that will be listening later to the recording. We say this prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.